a little being right. a little under the weather. I appreciate that. Of course, good to be here. Cool. And I love, you know, I love meeting uh, up, up and coming artists and filmmakers because that I, I feel, even though I'm old now, I feel like I was in you guys' shoes not that long ago. Um, yeah. And it was not easy and it is a whirlwind. Um, but I had people who, you know, kept me going and, you know, it was worth it in the end. It just took a long time. Yeah. So, and 43 is not old. 43 yeah. is not old. <laughs> Getting there, getting there. Yeah. Cool. Well, my name is Nina Uguomo. Just to formally introduce myself, I'm the founder and CEO of Student Dream. And our sueñito is to embolden youth to build legacy. And so we do that by training students of color age 16 to 24 to build wealth. And that means we're creating courses, we create media, and we create music centered around personal finance, investing entrepreneurship and music wow. business. And our, we're, our core values that we always like to root what we do in is I think things that really relate to you, family, legacy, and freedom. And so mm. I think I've, I, I wanted to reach out to you, not just because I reach out to all these directors or producers, but because I found it very interesting, just the stories that I was first exposed to you telling particularly mm. with crazy rich Asians. And then in the Heights, I was like, man, what's this, what's this Asian dude do it? You know, why did he, what prompted him to create in the Heights and just hearing your story and just your, your passion for telling different stories and bringing out that representation. I was like, man, I really rock with that. And just to see the way you infuse the arts, the other parts of the arts, whether mm. that was dance or music or just cinematography, the mm -hmm. angling, I just, yeah. I thought, and, and even just your new venture with the food and just telling story through food. I yeah. just, at the end of the day, the core of what we do is helping young people find their voice. And there's this great um, frame that I saw when I think I was at Burlington or Marshalls and it said, yeah. be, a, be a voice, not an echo. You know, be a voice, mm. not an echo. And I think mm. to really be a voice and not an echo, you have to go through that journey of finding your story and just hearing your story of finding your story really resonated with me. And I want to kind of tap into that during our time together today. And that's why I reached out and totally. thank you again for taking the time. And so- Social media is amazing that we can right. actually connect. <laughs> right. I've never met before and have no relationship with each other. The fact that we can just do that is- Awesome. Yeah, when and you just your openness. Bit, and when you told me, you know, the students that you had, and I, I, you know, this is this is there are moments like these where I, when I was again as a young artist, really helped me see something that maybe the people around me couldn't help me see. So whatever way I can help do that, of course. I appreciate you. I saw so something that I saw something at a JC Penny that inspired me for years too, and it said, um, it said you can't uh, change someone who doesn't want to be changed or something like that but never underestimate the power of planting a seed mm. and to me that was like whether people are ready for it or not if you're ready to say it don't underestimate the power of that existing in the world i love that going a long ways. thank you john and so i always like to start with having the person i'm interviewing introduce themselves because of course i could easily take from your bias so i love for you john Introduce yourself to the students here, to the people listening and watching. Who is John Chu? I'm John M. Chu, and I am a 42-year-old, not quite 43 yet, but about, about to be, um, filmmaker. And uh, I grew up in uh, Los Altos, California, which is the Silicon Valley. Um, I grew up in the 80s and the 90s there. I was the youngest of five kids. Um, my oldest brother is six and a half years older than me. Um, I have two sisters and my other brother uh, he has, uh, is autistic. And so um, our family is very close. My parents have a Chinese restaurant in the Bay Area. They started in 1969. So I grew up in that restaurant, basically doing my homework at the bar, folding napkins um, and, um, and uh, watching my grandma do the books with her abacus. Um, she was wow. really quick with the abacus. Um, and so, and my parents came over to the States when they were 19, 20 years old. They didn't know a word of English, came to the Bay Area. They met in the Bay Area and they only knew Beatles songs and 
uh, Elvis songs. And uh, they had all these kids and they wanted us to be as immersed in American culture, whatever that means, uh, as much as possible. And so I'm the youngest, like I said, so I got, um, I don't have the baggage that my older brothers and sisters have that when they were being raised, my aunts and uncles, they were all young and they were all putting their hopes and dreams in these kids. So I got to be a little bit of an observer during that time. Anyway, got to make some movie it. and here I am now. Awesome, in summary. Yes, and in so summary. I went to so USC. Of, oh, cool. <laughs> and you did some damage at USC. I saw those awards. And so I wanna tap into that in a bit. <clears throat> yes. But one thing that really stood out to me with your story is that your parents were in the, and have been in the restaurant business for 51 years. Yeah, and so they're still in it. It's still there. Right. Shout yeah, out to yeah. Chef Choose. When I'm in LA next time, I'm going to visit, or no, San Francisco. San Francisco. Bay no, Aaron. I'm serious. You need to let me know. They will take care. They will love to take care of you. I will. And so, how did growing up in that environment contribute to the way you approach filmmaking and other forms of entrepreneurship that you're tapping into? Well, growing up in a restaurant, I don't know if I'm sure maybe some people have uh, a family that owns restaurants or they grew up in a restaurant, but it's very different. You are on constant display. If your parents are like, my parents were definitely constantly telling the customers what was happening in our lives. So we were always, I feel like it was, if you were like, uh, like a, 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 a morning radio show host's son or daughter, like that's what we were. Like we were always, if we're going through stuff, if we had a fight with our parents, the whole restaurant would know. And so in, in a weird way, the restaurant is a house of stories. Uh, Every way, everywhere you go, they're telling a story or they're hearing a story um, or they're painting a story with a food um, or food is the medium for a story that they're telling why you have certain dishes or. So for me, um, growing up around that was always either putting on a show or taking in a show. Um, and I remember watching my dad, but also when the customers are gone, you get to see behind the show, which is a kitchen full of people working really, really hard for their families um, who may smile at the front, but it's hard in the back. And I remember seeing my dad and my mom get treated a certain way by certain customers, you know, talk down to them. I think people when they, in the service business, people who come to a restaurant think that when you work for them in some way. So they would talk down and my dad and my mom are very proud people. So I'm watching this like shocked. Yeah. And I remember them sitting me down and they said, John, we, some of these people have never met a Chinese family before. So they have certain ideas of who we are and will treat us accordingly. But our job, since we're one of the first families here is to treat them kindly anyway. And so when they walk away, their heart is full and their belly is full. And next time they see a Chinese family, maybe they won't, they, maybe they'll have to double think their assumptions at that point. And that's our responsibility. So that, the idea of, I guess, representation or whatever we call it, um, was, was imbued very young. A responsibility of ambassadorship was very young in me. Not that I accepted that. I was like, screw that, who cares, they're idiots. But still, it was inside. The, the seed was planted, as they say, as J.C. Penny will say. Right. Come um, on, J.C. Penny, <laughs> with the with the wisdom. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna have to get that calendar at some point. But um, the so so it was definitely. I think that really. And and then when I go back into the kitchen, I see my dad and my mom working with the dishwashers and with the chefs, and they're sweating their butt off. So they're working very hard. And I, that to me, that is the, was the American dream. They came here not having anything and they really believed in the American dream. Now, whether that is good or bad, they believed it and they made it so, and they made us believe it. And um, the American dream was about working really hard and taking care of the family. And for us, they wanted, they wouldn't even let me work at the restaurant, even though we fully Interesting. They didn't let us like serve because they didn't want us my mom said this specifically. She's like, I don't want you to get used to like cash tips as a, such a young age. Fascinating. Like, do, wow. Do everything that we couldn't do. Don't think about money right now. Like go, I'm going to put you in a dance class. I'm going to put you in a art class or something. They put everything into us. And so, and I know that that's, that's very rare. And also I, I feel very lucky that I did have parents like that. Um, but they didn't want us to just start counting money yet. Uh, of course, eventually they were like, okay, now it's time to think about money. But at that point, they just wanted us to play. And um, I think that allowed That's us awesome. to 
find stuff that we probably wouldn't have otherwise. That's very different than any other Asian family in that neighborhood. Yeah, interesting. And so when you think about, I mean, just the tremendous investment that your family had invested in you, even now that you have three kids, I love their names, by the way. I, I think I have Willow on VHS. Yeah. The, you know, I love In the Heights. And then, nice. uh, and so, so Ruby is the third one, yes. Right, Ruby. And so as I've listened to all your interviews, you say time and time again that you're focused on the stories you want to tell your kids. And mm-hmm. so what exactly is the story that you want to tell your kids? To tell Ruby and Willow and That's Jonathan. Yes. Jonathan Height. Jonathan Height. Yes. Um, that's a good question. You know, my, I think I don't know yet. I think it changes. I think it evolves. I okay. think that um, just so everyone knows what I've usually said is like the greatest story I've, I have to tell now is to my kids. It's not, it's no longer my movies or my TV shows. It's how do I want the kids to see the world? Yeah. And I only am thinking about it because I'm at a certain age with certain young kids and I'm watching them. I didn't have younger siblings. So I never watched young people's brains start to like um, illuminate and start to uh, understand the world. I've never experienced that. So I'm watching it for the first time in the last four years, having done crazy rich Asians and in the Heights. And I'm watching them and I'm watching them in the world that they're coming into, understanding the internet like no other, like understanding sarcasm and, and, what a, you know, my, my daughter asked me the other day, she asked my friend who came to me, I was like, this is crazy. But we were watching, they were watching The Little Mermaid and she asked my friend, she's like, so in this shot, where did they put the camera underwater? How did they move, how did they, and my friend was like, what? She's like, yeah, where, if, they, if the camera is underwater here, how did they put the camera in the, to get the mermaid? So they live in a world that is like insane to me. Like I never have to understand those concepts. And she lives in a world where she's literally on the streets of Washington Heights watching amazing, you know, 300 right. dancers, um, you know, dancing on two and like listen and, and listening to this music and having this energy and they, and she's dancing too. And, and, and she sees um, no difference than, you know, her watching whatever on television. Like it's right. all- It's real life, so IRL, it is real life. Totally. <laughs> it's not even- and so for me, it's just like, I love that she gets to live in a world that she's exposed to all of this. Now, how do you form that and say, hey, our job is to help continue to see more and be curious about more people. Mm-hmm. I see her being scared to even just as simple as like going to school or, or, or meeting new friends. And all I want to like try to put into her is, is, is like, it's always scary to meet someone new. It's always scary to start something new. You're always going to be a beginner. But every time you start, you know, once you get through it, it's so fun to know those things. It's so fun to like uh, suddenly understand, um, you know, or, or know what the taste of this food. So I'm constantly like, try this food. Yeah. You don't have to like it, but you have to try it at least. And I'm not the best at it, but I'm really like trying to stay as conscious to be as make her as curious and all my kids, they're a little young, but still curious and interested in, you know, new, new, in new things. So we'll see what happens with that as we get, as they get older, how cynical I want them to be. I think growing up in LA, you get a certain cynicism, but um, so we'll see how that evolves. But for me right now, I want them to be, I want them to love people and know that people are good. Mm. Not be naive about it, but I think if you don't believe people are good, or at least have a perspective that is good, that makes sense to them, even if it doesn't match up with your needs, that everyone has some sort of currency and needs that if we just shared with each other, we might understand each other. Again, that might not right. mean like that means you can understand. I just want to equip her with those kind of things so that she can never feel like it's a dead end. I love that. I love that. And even to go off of that curiosity, it seems, and correct me if I'm wrong, but even with the the choices of movies that you've created and that are currently in production, whether you think about Crazy Rich Asians, In the Heights, Wicked, it Mm -hmm. seems like that's full of, or even Dr. Seuss and animation, it seems like there's this 
this curiosity that is drives you in the choices of the music, the movies that you make. And yeah. so, and I know that there was a shift that took place when you talked about really embracing your cultural identity and not being ashamed or afraid to put that on display, even under some of the constraints of what makes a movie profitable, et cetera. Yeah. But what is, what is a mindset shift that changed your approach to the type of films that you make or just the way you move as a filmmaker, storyteller? Yeah. Let me correct that by saying the way that you move as a storyteller. Well, um, I think you have to understand a little bit of the journey to understand my answer for that. And I think yeah. that when I was at USC, I made some short films that got attention. I just so happened to hit on subjects that were that people had made it in a certain way that got attention and got me into the business. Steven Spielberg saw my short film. Um, in fact, um, I made a short film uh, before that. I was in there's four films that they they allow seniors to direct for your at film school for the final year. And it's called 480. And so as a freshman, I went to go see the 480s of that year, who are the seniors and how amazing their movies are. And everybody has to crew on their movies. Um, but one person gets to, write, to, to direct it or write it or both. And I went and saw it and there was this comedy that this woman did and it was a dating comedy. And the end sort of part of it was she opens these doors and see all these like, dudes and her, she opens the last door and it's an Asian guy, nothing wrong with him, just opens the door, Asian guy. And she goes, um, no. And she slams the door in his face and the whole place laughed. And I was so confused. I, I didn't understand why people were laughing. And I actually literally had to turn to my friend and be like, wait, what has happened? Why is everybody laughing? And he's like, well, you know, it's like a, it's like an Asian dude. I'm like, yeah, and what is that? And he's like, yeah, she'd never date that guy. And I'm like, that's crazy that we're in LA and that we're all okay with this. And I was like, when I become a senior, I'm going to make a movie that goes exactly like, directly against this thing. And so I made a movie called Guaylo, which means white devil, which is what they called me when I went to Hong Kong for the first time. Because they're like, I went there being like, oh, wow, I'm like them and they treat me like family. And then they called me Guaylo because they're like, no, you're not. You're, you're a white dude. Let's just be clear about that. So, and, 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 and so that, that I, dual identity, that cultural identity crisis, I wanted to make a short film about. So I did. And it's the first time I ever dealt with that. I never wanted to be known as an Asian director. I just want to be known as a director. I just want to be known as like the guy who is like Spielberg or Zemeckis or Tim Burton, not, oh, you're the Asian director. Like that drove me crazy. And so when I made this, I knew I was going to put a light, light on my Asian-ness. And, but I was gonna do it in a way that I could say something about it. But when I was making it, I was so self-conscious about the, I didn't know, I hadn't dealt with it actually. I had never like, there were no other Asian American people in my, in, like that wasn't even a term back then. Um, maybe it was a light term, but not really like a category yet. And I hadn't, I hadn't found others like me. And so um, I was very self-conscious about the scenes that I put in the movie about it about the people making fun of me. People in my class would be like, well, that seems over the top, Did that really happened. And I'd question myself like, yeah, that does seem over the top. Maybe it didn't happen. So by the time we screened it, <coughs> excuse me, um, I was so self-conscious about it. Everybody loved it, but I did not submit it to any festivals. I didn't put it in any competitions or anything like that. I just, I couldn't, it was, it was hard to watch. And so I just wasn't ready. And so I put it away and I made a different musical about a totally different subject about mothers. And that's the one that Spielberg saw. So in a weird way, I was rewarded for not dealing with my Asian identity crisis. I was given the path into Hollywood. And when and the, and the what's great about being discovered by Steven Spielberg is like, you get to make movies. I didn't have to do PA jobs. I didn't have to do another job. I became a filmmaker at a studio. The problem with that is that you don't know how to do it again because you didn't go through the steps to earn that. You just won the lottery. And so I spent a good 10 years making movies, big movies with The Rock, with Bruce Willis, with Michael Caine, Morgan Freeman, Mark Ruffalo, with this thing of like, how do I, am I supposed to be here? And part of that is imposter syndrome, but it actually was real because I actually hadn't had the experience to really fully be there. And, so I always felt self-conscious and I always, always 
um, doing things. And, and in a weird way, I also love making movies because I like, I'm not like a movie aficionado. Like I'm not somebody who knows every actor and every movie and every director. I love the, I love the process of making a movie. Um, and so I don't have a destination of a movie. I just have like, I want to work with people and I want to work in this area and I want to like figure it out with them because that's what drives me. That's why my movies jump from like a step up movie to a Justin Bieber documentary, to a GI Joe movie, to a heist, to Gem in the Hollow. They're all so random because I'm like, I've never done that one. I, I want to try that and see if I'm good at that. <laughs> and some I fall and fail and others I can, I can works out. Like, I don't know, but, yeah. but I love the, I love the energy of that. So it wasn't until uh, now you see me too that I'm working with all these great actors. This is only a four or five years ago <coughs> that I'm looking around and I realize I could almost hit, I hit my ten thousand hours. Like I realize, oh, I do know what I'm doing because I'm hanging with these great actors and I can do this. And then it hit me, well, what the hell am I doing here? Anyone can make this movie. Who am I? And what do I have to say now? Okay, now you know you belong here. What are you gonna say? Who are you as a filmmaker? And that's where I went. That's where I was like, I don't know. I don't know who I am. And I told my agents and managers, I said, I gotta do a movie that explores who I am as an artist or as a person. And so I'm not gonna make you any money, but I need this if I want fuel for the next 10 years of my life. And they said, okay, cool. And I went back to the person who I was like, what do I wanna talk about? And of course, when you're in college, you have the most, you're the most potent and you're the most open of like, these are the things I wanna say. And I went back to my bank of feelings, of emotions. Oh yeah, those are the things that are most important to me. And my Asian American identity crisis was right at the top and it scared me the most. But at this point I, had, I was old enough and, 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 and confident enough that I could tackle it in a new perspective, in a new way. Um, and so that's when I went on a search and I found two projects that fit that bill. One was Crazy Rich Asians, which was a book. I didn't, the book was like, you know, silly about rich Asian people, but, but deep down was an Asian American woman who went to Asia for the first time. That was my experience going to Hong Kong and they don't accept her. And then how do you find your self-worth in all that journey? So that made a lot of sense to me. And the other one was In the Heights because they came to me, I remember seeing it on Broadway and I, I obviously I'm not from Washington Heights, obviously I'm not a Latino, but it was, Lynn has an amazing way of connecting stories that feel universal because that's how I felt in my immigrant community in Los Altos, California on the other side of the country as an Asian person. And so, but, but, but the hopes and the dreams of dreaming in your bedroom of grand things and nobody understanding it and looking and the yearning of looking outside your window of the restaurant and dreaming of what you can be. And some people wanting, you know, wanting to defend the, the city, <coughs> others wanting to escape the city. That dynamic was very interesting. So those two came at the same time. And I just so happened to do Crazy Rotations first and In the Heights second. Sorry, that was a That's long That's amazing. Answer. No, I love it. That was rich. And yeah. I, of the many things I got out of that, I love that you were not, you said, I was just not afraid to like try new things, even if it failed, even if, even if like, even if it, I succeeded, it took you on this adventure of going from GI Joe to Justin Bieber to In the Heights. I love that because I think as anybody who's a dreamer, you gotta not be afraid to try. I think it's that childlike faith. And that's one of the reasons why like, I'm so inspired by kids because they are not afraid to try. They don't care what they look like. Yeah. And that's yeah. one thing we always try to emphasize with our students, like just try. Yeah. And so- People always try to put you in a box. Yeah. We'll always be like, well, you don't want to get pigeonholed, do you? Oh, you don't want to be that. Well, people are going to think this of you if you. And you're like, you don't live my life, so let me do what I feel compelled to do, and that will be very different than anyone else. Uh, no one can follow that, and I think that that's. I mean, who knows where that leads? Um, right. And again, sometimes in my hardest, and I don't even call them failures, but my hardest sort of obstacles in my movies, I don't feel like. Uh, I think I, I, became, I became so much so much better for them. And that's a part of my journey, not someone else's story of that. And so uh, they never could understand. Don't let, don't that let anybody put you in a box. No. And so my last question before opening it up to our students is what are three things that you're thankful for? I am thankful that life is long, that it keeps going. 
I'm thankful that it's never fixed, that we keep having to fix it when it's broken because that's what makes it worth living. And I'm really thankful. Uh, I'm really thankful for art as a way to uh, express myself because I think if it wasn't for art, I would be a very lost person. I didn't have a voice before it, before editing. I didn't, I didn't know what to do with it. I, I played sports, wasn't very good. I drew, I was pretty good, not the best. I played mu music. Okay, I didn't practice that much. Uh, and, uh, but it was something about editing and shooting that when it all came together, I was like, this, this is a part of my language. And I felt very free after that. And I continue to this day, even if I didn't get movies, I'd be making videos for my, you know, my neighborhood and I would feel just as fulfilled for that. So I, I feel very, um, I like making stuff. It helps me cope. I love that. Thank you, John. And I know, do you do you have a hard stop at two o'clock at <coughs> in two minutes? Um, I do, but we can go quickly. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I add five minutes. Okay. See. Awesome. All right. I'm gonna open it up to all of our students. Nehemiah, go and introduce hey, uh, who you're. Nehemiah, share who you are, where you're, where you're suited at, and go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Hey, John. Thank you so much for being here. This was super insightful and super inspiring. I'm Nehemiah Wilson. Uh, an up and coming director in Atlanta. And then I just gave me my first directing opportunity and I was just in LA. So we just wrapped up our project. So super excited about that. Um, Jordan was also there in van. Uh, we all worked together. But um, my question that. is your background, you know, growing up in the environment you grew up in, having parents who poured into you, which is kind of different than what you saw in the environment. I had a similar uh, background with my parents coming from Philadelphia, inner city, and pouring into me and my siblings in that way. Um, and growing up, I think I've devalued that experience and I've always felt like inside that those experiences of the good things I've experienced have not been as valid as someone who have gone through like negative things, if that makes sense. Cause I feel like those negative experiences are romanticized in media in general. So did yeah. you ever deal with that is my question. And if not, like, did you have any people around you that did and how they get through it? I'm just kind of wondering how to navigate that whole thing. Yeah, I, I feel that a lot. Of course, you know, when you say like, oh, my parents were so helpful and, and you, like people don't want to hear that because people don't have, not everybody has that experience. And so I am very self-conscious of when I say that, but I also can't deny what I lived. And so I'm trying to be as truthful as possible that I was privileged in certain ways. I wasn't privileged in other ways. Nobody thought an Asian American could be, should be a director. I go, I roll up to the studio, even getting movies and they're like, oh no, deliveries are in the back. So like that, that's like normal. In fact, the other day I was in at, at Pennsylvania and in, in UPenn and I was speaking at UPenn and I, it was late at night and I got some food and I was coming back into the hotel and they wouldn't let me in the hotel because they thought I was a delivery guy. Delivery, <laughs> granted I had Wawa's, which is, you know, I don't, I, I never seen it. Anyway, so yes, of course I'm, but, but I guess it's like, what are you gonna do about it? It is what your life is. And it doesn't, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't invalidate it. It just, I think as long as you have, at least as long as I think we understand the privileges that we do have and that our responsibility to pass on that, that, and that, that we don't expect, you know, I see like certain celebrities or people being like, oh, people are too lazy to work. Like, no, some people have to work their ass off and they're not making enough money to even survive. Like sometimes there's a system wrong, not the person that's wrong. And I think that, that as long as we can be conscious of that, uh, I think that's the best we can do. But I, I would hate to lie about it and say I grew up some other way. Right. Absolutely, yeah. thank you for that. Anyone else, question? <laughs> Go ahead, Elijah, and then Van. How are you doing? My name is Elijah. I'm a student at Stevenson University in Baltimore. Um, I'm a senior film student. I'm working on my senior thesis film as we speak. Um, so I'm really excited to be working on that. And I just wanted to know, what were some of your biggest takeaways from your formative years as a filmmaker at USC? Um, one was <clears throat> my crew was everything, like your community of filmmakers. Like you said, you know, Jordan helped you or, 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 or Ethan helped you. Um, 
on or Van helps you on your on your on your video. Um, those that is so valuable because. Film school isn't for everybody. Not everybody should go to film school. You don't actually need film school at all. But I, what helped me, film school helped me was I, I got plugged into a community of people who love making movies and needed to make movies as much as I did because I wasn't finding that in high school. And that community, I helped um, on their sets and they helped on my sets. And that that mean that meant we didn't we didn't need money to raise in order to make something. Like we had each other to make it. And that was really, really, really valuable. Some of those people I still work with today are DP Alice Brooks, who did In the Heights, who's doing Wicked for me, uh, who just she she just did Tick Tick Boom for Lynn. We worked together in 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 college at um, in film school, and we stuck together during that time. Some most of the movies when I made the leap, I couldn't get her on, but eventually we did, and we, and, and we stuck together. There's also some editors who I've worked with since high school, or for instance, college. Um, and others. So um, that community is very important. I'd say take care of that community and they'll take care of you too. Yeah, and awesome. you know what? Not everyone's going to be destined to be a filmmaker. Everyone, mm -hmm. has, and I also there's another way it's like we are all trained as storytellers. Filmmaking is one medium of storytelling, it's not the medium of storytelling. So I would keep your mind open. And I saw this a lot, people who were destined to be in, you know, a sound mixer, they loved, obviously the only way in is being a storyteller or being a filmmaker. And the only way into that is saying that you want to be a director, but in getting into the nitty gritty, sound was where they were like, saw things that no one else could see. And rather than be embarrassed about going into sound mixing, it was like, oh, that's your medium of storytelling. Or if you're going into marketing outside of filmmaking, yeah, that's a that's storytelling. And by the way, if you're selling a business, if you're an entrepreneur, you're still telling stories every day about that's your actually business. Exactly um, what I'm getting into. I'm getting into marketing uh, post college. Nice. All this stuff is valuable. When you learn how uh, to use audiovisual grammar, that is so valuable for you, and and not just for you as a storyteller, but also as you as an observer of news, of media, of people telling you how to be. You'll, you know how to decode that too, so. Awesome. Much. All right, last question. Thanks so much, Elijah. Is from Van. So Van. Hey, how are you doing, man? Uh, my name is Van. I currently live in Los Angeles, but I'm actually in Virginia, my hometown. I'm actually sitting in my family's uh, uh, business right now. So it's funny you're telling a story about family business. Um, but real quick, I'm a stills photographer um, out in LA. I shoot on film and television sets. So I'm just curious to know what um, what role does still images play in the movie making process for you? Um, great question. I um, I love taking pictures. I shoot with um, I shoot all the time. Um, I use it. Uh, obviously, we have our on set uh, shooters, um, and and that's really helpful. But for me, I images. Um, when I, when I first get onto a project, um, I collect a lot of images. I take a lot of pictures um, and I keep them in, in, I have a Dropbox and I just have folders and folders of, of my curated images of forests, of buildings, of characters, of certain things. And when I start a project, I get the ones that most, uh, uh, most sort of inspire these specific characters. Um, and so, and then when I start to learn how to make those images myself, because some of them are magazine polls, some of them are just like commercials, then I use my camera to learn all that stuff. So all that stuff is really valuable for me because it is, I mean, we're just moving pictures, but we're the same ideas of what framing, uh, what does it evoke? What's negative space? What does one angle versus another angle? What does that mean? I'm always learning when I'm taking pictures. So I don't know if that's your question necessarily, but, but for me personally, stills, are very helpful for my process as I take pictures because I'm learning a lot also about lenses and light, but but um, but also part of the communicating process of what I'm trying to get visually across. Got it. No, that helps. I have two more questions if we have some time. They're quick. It's up do to it. John. Yes. We do okay. it. One. Um, oh, it's eleven oh seven. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Go. Hurry. Quick. I was just gonna say what um what got you into the film. Filmmaking. I think you told us a little bit of your background, but I don't think you really told us like what made you want to get into filmmaking and directing. I was really young, and that's probably the other thing I'm really grateful for is that I learned what I wanted 
very young. I was probably 10, nine, 10 years old. And um, I, my, my parents had a video camera, this big old video camera, and I would be the one in charge of carrying it around. And so I shot my family doing stuff. And then one day, um, uh, there was this magazine called Sharper Image. You guys are probably too young to know, but it was like this magazine that had all like weird gadgets and stuff. And one of them was this mixer where you could take VCRs and, 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 and string them together and cut something. And so I got my dad to get me this thing. And I promised him I would make, you know, videos for his restaurant if he got me this. I never made those things, but I cut together our vacation video. And when I showed my parents, I remember watching them watch it and they cried because they had never seen our family like the way they like, like on the on the TV, the way they would see TV shows, families. And I knew I, at that point I was like, I'm in. Um, whether I was going to get paid for it or not, that was it. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, cool. Thanks for sharing. Um, then the last thing is just, is it okay if I shoot my shot and send you my portfolio? I'm looking for some work in L.A. <laughs> send me whatever you guys want awesome. I want to, I want to see your shorts that you finish, when you finish them too John it's done I can give you it's the sneak done. peek can it's we send done. you the sneak yeah. peek send it. Send it. it's like a sueñito of sueñitos brother send it. So, send it. well John thank you so much for being here can't say thank you enough we will I'll, when we edit this I'll send it to you before you know for approval and everything but thank you so much John this means the most and it says a lot about who you are just to to respond to the DM. So I, I appreciate you so much. So I'm thankful for you and you taking the time and the stories that you've told are so good and your love for your family. And I'm thankful for your story and your, your Chef Chu's being around 51 years. So thank, thank you, you for, for all that you do, Thank John. you for you to, to, yeah. to mention these, these, all these young artists. Like yeah. that, this is so important. We need you guys more than anything. It thank is you. a hard, long road. You guys will be alone, a lot of it. Just yeah. know if you really uh, love it, you you survive it. It's all worth it. I promise you. Yeah. Um. And that and that storytelling is more than just making a movie. Mm. There's so many ways you can tell your story through different mediums. So be open Thank about. Thank you that. so much, John. And we're here. Let if there's is there any way that we can support you and all that you're doing, whether it's with. The I want to see your shorts. Make sure they're awesome. Okay. I want I want to meet you guys another time and and you tell me like remember when we met in that thing and now look at me <laughs> I'm on this award show. And then, yes. and then I'll ask you for a job. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John. Enjoy the rest of your day and I'll send you that short. Sounds thank good. you. All right. Thank you so much. Bye. And thank you, Nana, for putting Woo! this together and bringing us here. <laughs> Appreciate you so much. You just that spoke was with though. John Chu. That's Crazy. amazing. <laughs> He's like, I love that he was saying like, oh yeah, you know, Lynn and I was talking. <laughs> like, yeah.